a phase one environmental site assessment is really an industry standard that is designed to uh, identify specialized knowledge, purchase price, reasonably ascertainable historical information so that we as an environmental professional can determine if there uh, has been or there is the probability of a release of a hazardous substance on, at, or in a property. Uh, and that's really the key. So a uh, phase one environmental site assessment would include historical records review, a site reconnaissance, interviews with past owners, as well as the user or the purchaser of that property. Uh, obviously, then it requires that you develop a report and that you or I or others within SES that are environmental professionals render that opinion as to whether there is or is not a rec, a recognized environmental condition. And so we identify recognized environmental conditions. Well, what does that mean? So what are the next steps? And as you know, this industry was born out of the innocent purchaser defense in 1986. And since that time under CERCLA, we've been afforded other defenses. It could be uh, a bona fide prospective purchaser. It could be the adjacent property owner. Uh, so there are defenses under CERCLA that would allow me to proceed uh, with the purchase of that real estate without uh, taking liability on for those past sins or those past releases. And that is really the key to understanding the client's needs and structuring the deal so that they can move forward without taking on the liability, acquire the property, maybe even a brownfields that is knownly contaminated, and therefore we want to redevelop it with the understanding that we will have continuing obligations uh, to meet to continue to have that landowner liability protection. And so understanding our clients' needs with that property will help us navigate. Do they need to do a phase two and actually investigate the location and the quantity or the concentrations of contaminants? Or are they uh, flexible enough in their development plan that they don't really need to know that finite information and they can go ahead and proceed as a bona fide prospective purchaser without doing that additional due diligence? And as an old RICRA mentor of mine said, the correct answer is it depends uh, mm -hmm. because it really does depend on each unique individual case. And I think that's what's so beautiful about SES and our network of a thousand professionals across the country is we have a lot of gray hair. We have a lot of wisdom. And oftentimes we've been there, done that. And so we can benefit and our clients can benefit by bringing in that expertise. Now, doing uh, a phase one is sort of the catch-all tool, uh, and there's there's some time, there's some uh, aspects of a phase one that may uh, that may not fulfill all the needs of a client. They may also want some other related service, like an environmental compliance audit, which is not a component of the standard phase one, but it is something a service we can provide. Or they may need assistance with environmental permitting. Uh, again, non-scope, non-phase one scope services. So just to, not to get too far down in the weeds or off on a tangent. Well, I think that's a great sidebar though, because oftentimes when you get that phone call that says, I need an environmental, uh, I call it peeling the onion because <laughs> are they after an all appropriate inquiry or an ASTM phase one ESA? Or is there environmental that, hey, I'm getting ready to do major renovation. I already own the building. Do I have asbestos? Do I have lead-based paint? Do I have other things that under the federal NESHAP requirement I have to address? And so I think that's important that when we engage with clients, we peel the onion. We understand what their project objectives are and what their needs are, because oftentimes that phase one environmental site assessment will lead into those building sciences asbestos, lead, radon, vapor mitigation. Sometimes it'll lead into site redevelopment and engineering associated with stormwater, et cetera. So you're absolutely right. Uh, that's a great point there. So brownfields and the fact that under the brownfields, you know, we had the Brownfields Revitalization Act of 2002 that really brought forward the bona fide perspective purchaser landowner liability protection defense under CERCLA. It really created that opportunity for folks to move forward with known contaminated sites without that liability. But we had the BUILD Act, right, in 2018. And that BUILD Act even opened up 
brownfields revitalization further. It now allowed municipalities and others, uh, you know, 501c3 nonprofits to qualify for landowner liability protections now under that Build Act of 2018. So um, that's been a great thing. And I'm just curious what you've seen uh, in, in your markets there on the West Coast. And I know you do a lot of work down South as well, but um, what are your thoughts on the Build Act and kind of the new uh, administration? One, one potential party that could rely on this is a, a tenant at a facility. So someone who's just going to be, they're not going to uh, take ownership of a property. They're just going to lease it and operate their business. But the, you know, it's in a site, it's in a known area with environmental impacts, and they don't want to be come and start new operations in 2021 and all of a sudden get dragged into something that, that they didn't have any responsibility for. Uh, from some historical legacy contamination. So the interesting thing there is that we do conduct environmental due diligence and a, a phase one environmental site assessment or assist uh, uh, industrial tenants who are going to move into facilities doing what you might call like an entry, a baseline. And, and, and we've done a lot of these where we're doing a phase one to establish baseline conditions. We even do phase twos just to establish baseline conditions. Imagine uh, for a moment you're, uh, a, you're a new startup company that's going to enter a building and do plating operations. But the building you're going to occupy previously housed another plating operation back in the 1950s, 60s, 70s you're going to want to know and establish what the conditions are on the front end so that you don't, when you leave the building many years from now, hopefully after having operated a successful business there and move to a, yet another bigger building because your business is going so well, you, you don't want to inherit liability for someone else's problems. So the, the BUILD Act provides the legal mechanisms for a tenant to determine what the environmental conditions are on the front end and uh, obtain that same risk management, the liability controls. Yep, that's a great point. And that was a benefit of the BUILD Act was uh, affording that liability protection to lessees. And, and a great example that I've dealt with numerous times in my career is, you know, in the aviation industry, typically uh, aircraft maintenance facilities are at airports or former Air Force bases, and they typically do not purchase those. They are tenants. And so establishing that is really important. So that is that is a great point. You know, we might just pivot one last thing, and that is that, you know, sometimes a environmental uh, isn't because I'm a new lessee and it isn't because I'm taking title to real property. I already own it. And so sometimes there's maybe an entry point to an environmental uh, that is not a full-fledged phase one ESA. It might be a transaction screen. It might be a limited environmental review, or it might be under the Small Business Administration, just a record search and risk assessment uh, type opportunity. So again, I think we don't have to drill down into those today, Justin, maybe another day. But I think the thing, the thing to remember is that when I feel that phone call or I have that person that's in my circle of influence or my social circle that says, hey, what about? You know, the industry was born out of kind of that phase one ESA. It became the standard. Uh, it is now the standard through the all appropriate inquiry. But it's important that we talk about needs, wants, wishes, hopes, and dreams and understand that project life cycle because it might just be a transaction screen is appropriate and we don't have to do that full phase one ESA. So I, I really like that conversation. Justin and I will be serving now uh, as recently you know, appointed national experts. Uh, that role is not just external facing to our great clients, but it's also to our practitioners and um, so the, the door is always open. And as we come out of the pandemic and we begin to uh, see the conversions that are likely to take place in downtown urban areas from office space to mixed use or residential space, uh, this, this industry is going to be extremely busy. SES and our footprint across the country 
and our proximity to potential project sites really positions us well to provide that level of support.